Claude headed our little procession to Zagad's office. It was he who threw the door open. It was he who introduced us as representatives of the plant council, namely as emissaries of a vast, nebulous entity, as agents of a powerful repressive apparatus. It wasn't I, and it couldn't have been. I would have knocked on Zagad's door, entered sheepishly and hesitantly. I would have begun to implement our strategy by saying, Good morning, Mr. Zagad, and my admirable plan would have vanished the moment Zagad had said, Good morning, Yarostan. What can I do for you? I'm not the hero you've bothered to remember for two decades, Sophia. My thoughts weren't on Zagad, but on Louisa. I was proud of our action because I was sure she would be pleased. I thought I had redeemed myself in her eyes and in Titus's as well. And I was terribly confused. Had I redeemed myself to Louisa as a politically conscious activist or as a lover? Such a separation hadn't existed before the strike. Suddenly there wasn't only a separation, but it seemed unbridgeable. I would be trusted by Titus and Louisa, but I would no longer be loved by Louisa. All this occurred to me only after Zagad left his office. Until then I had been carried away by everyone's enthusiasm, especially Sabina's. When Claude, Jan, and I had elected ourselves to implement my strategy, Sabina had jumped up to join us. On the way to Zagad's office, Jan and I had walked, or rather danced, behind Claude, with Sabina between us, her arms around our waists, ours around her waist. This will make everything possible, she'd kept saying filling my head with images of a world where everything would be possible, everywhere and at any time. Jan and I had lifted Sabina and flown her up the steps to Zagad's office. Suddenly Zagad had gone, and so were my images. Sabina's arm left my waist, and I was alone. How I envied Jan that moment. Sabina's enthusiasm didn't diminish after Zagad's departure. It increased. And she showered Jan with all of it. Claude walked out behind Zagad. Sabina shouted, We've done it, and wrapped herself around Jan. How I wished Louisa had wrapped herself around me, shouting, We've done it. How I wished Sabina had turned to me. I crawled out of the office, lonely, disoriented. Jan rushed after me and asked for a key to my room. He, he gave me the key to his. I didn't then understand the reason for the exchange, but I didn't ask. Jan and Sabina left together through the office building entrance. I shuffled from the office back to the workshop, but stopped behind a post before anyone saw me. I saw Louisa and Mark Glavney leaving by way of the workshop entrance, arm in arm, gesticulating and laughing. Titus and Yasna were still in the shop. I backed away from my post and rushed back through the office building to the street. I walked aimlessly and wanted to die. I had proved myself for nothing, to no one. All my explanations had been wrong. Louisa hadn't dropped me because of my backwardness, nor because she'd wanted to be detached, but because she'd found another lover. Titus hadn't scolded me because I'd taken Louisa from him. Only then did it dawn on me that just before Titus's outburst, during our meeting, I had laughed and nodded vigorously when Jan had proposed throwing all the machinery into the street as our first revolutionary act. How stupid I'd been to attribute Titus's outburst to jealousy. My sympathy for Jan's scheme defined me as an outright, quote, counter-revolutionary in Titus's eyes, since for Titus the machinery was the revolution, the two were synonyms. So that's when you turn to Sophia, Myrna concludes prematurely. Not yet, Myrna. That's when I met you. And you were disappointed, she says all too accurately. You'd hoped you'd find another Louisa. Did you know that already then, I ask? If I had, I wouldn't have cared. I had my own passions to worry about, she says. I spent the night in Jan's room, but I couldn't sleep. I remember why, but I'd rather skip over it. Early the next morning, I crawled back to my room. Sabina let me in. I wanted only to be left alone, to sleep. But Jan and Sabina were wide awake, and they had other plans for me. I had known since I'd first met Jan that he had hated his mother. I was soon to learn why. Sabina nestled up to me and told me, We're going to spend the day in the country. I told her to have a good time and let me sleep. You're not going to sleep today, she assured me, poking me in the ribs to keep me from trying. Jan and Sabina lifted me out of bed and forced strong coffee down my throat. We can't go without you, Jan explained. The revolution is going to spread to the peasantry, and your contribution is going to be indispensable. I was awake. You're needed to cement the great worker-peasant alliance, he continued. Brushing aside my objections, he went on, You don't have to harangue anyone. You don't have to organize anything. All you have to do is make love to the queen of the peasants. A woman slightly older than Louisa, but less experienced. That single act on your part will destroy religion and morality, the family and the state. That single act will set the fires of hell to all the peasantry's precious traditions, all their sacred bonds. Tomorrow peasants, leaving their burning villages, will mingle with workers, leaving their burning factories, and they'll all migrate across fields and over mountains, fulfilling every wish, satisfying every desire and every whim on the way. 
Myrna laughs. Did Jan really tell you that? And did you actually come looking for a, quote, woman slightly older than Louisa but less experienced? I obviously don't remember his exact words, but I swear what he said was very close to that. And I believed him. I actually thought he and Sabina felt sorry for me and intended to introduce me to someone like Louisa. That's marvelous, she exclaims. Now I remember why he had us all go picking berries. Why didn't you go through with it? Don't you see how right he was? All hell would have broken loose in a single instant, instead of cracking a little this year, a little the next, and again the next over such an endless expanse of time. I didn't think it was marvelous at the time, and I still don't think so. I think Jan and Sabina had devised a mean trick. Jan knew that the mere mention of Louisa's name would set me moving. He dangled Louisa in front of me during two tram rides and a substantial walk. We reached his house. He introduced me to his father, mother, and sister. I looked for the nearest chair. I had a splitting headache and felt like vomiting. I hadn't gone without sleep for so long during the entire war and resistance. A headache, Jan said. Well, isn't that too bad? You won't be able to join us on our berry-picking expedition. I got up in spite of my headache and my nausea. I didn't want to miss my promised rendezvous. Oh, no, you can't go in that condition, Jan insisted. You stay right here in the house where my mother can nurse you. Then he whispered, She's a real queen, Yarostan. Every bit as regal as the queen of heaven, and as pure as the mother of her lord, Jesus Christ. I vomited. Jan and his father helped me to the couch. Myrna and her mother cleaned up the mess. Then Jan left with his father, Sabina, and Myrna. I was alone in the house with the queen of the peasants. She brought me a wet cloth from my head and crossed herself when she handed it to me. Sometime later she handed me a newly dampened cloth and crossed herself again. She crossed herself every time she entered the front room to look in at me. She was deathly afraid of me. She seemed convinced I was either a thief or a murderer who had just escaped from prison. And one time she tiptoed through the room I was in and went to another room where she wailed prayers. I hated myself for having let myself be tricked into leaving my comfortable room in bed. I was nearly unconscious with pain when the berry pickers returned, and I was nauseated. I had no interest in eating the meal the queen of the peasants had spent the day preparing. Jan, Myrna, and Sabina put me to bed in Jan's room, or rather the guest room, since Jan explained, They call it my room, although I haven't spent a single night in it. You're the first person in this bed. My mother started building that room onto the house two years earlier, Myrna explains. Until then, Jan and I had always slept in the same room and in the same bed. One day she came into our room before we were up and saw us sleeping with our arms around each other. She saw us sleeping the way we'd always slept as far back as I could remember, and she yanked both of us out of bed and beat us with a broom, calling us the names of all the devils in hell. Jan left. I never shared a bed with him again. I cried for weeks. I hated her until she died. Then I understood why she beat us. So that was why Jan wanted to help me destroy religion and morality, the family, and the peasant community. I suspected this at the time, from much that Jan had told me, from much that he had done. Two years earlier, Myrna had been eight, namely the same age as Tina, when you watched over her in her bedroom. You described yourself as Tina's apprentice. You considered her old enough to teach you lathe-turning, machining. But that's your problem. In any case, I didn't think about it that night, or the following night, or during any of the hectic days before our arrest. And in time, I forgot why Jan had invited me to meet his family. While they carried me to bed, Sabina angrily whispered in my ear, Coward! Canon revolutionary! Everything depended on you, and you spoiled it all! I was too sick to respond. I woke up once during the night. My head was bursting. Jan was sound asleep next to me. The next time I awoke, it was morning. Jan was shaking me. Come on, let's get out of here. When I sat up, he added, Planned revolutions inevitably fail. Isn't that their very nature? But our trip wasn't a total failure. Anxious to keep the blessed young virgin out of Beelzebub's paws, Mother Superior placed the virgin directly into Satan's. Jan left the room laughing victoriously. Understanding nothing, I dressed hurriedly and rushed out of the room and then onto the street. I couldn't believe what I saw and heard. Myrna's mother stood near the doorway, grasping a broom, which she kept trying to raise, but which Myrna's father kept, kept lowering. So she was screeching at Sabina. You'll roast in hell, you shameless gutter snipe. You'll burn for all eternity. Sabina, her back arched like a cat's, stood right in front of the woman and shouted just as loudly. You'll freeze where you're going, you dried-up carcass, you vampire that sucks life out of the living because there's none left in you. What happened that night? I asked Myrna. She brought my brother's destruction, Myrna says bitterly, my father's death, my mother's. I mean that night, Myrna, I interrupt impatiently. Would you rather forget? Doesn't this letter tell you what happened? How could I ever forget? My mother was right. Sabina put the devil's blood into my veins, the hypocrite. For twenty years I thought she'd done it for me. But the fiend has no kindness, no heart. Her deeds are for herself alone. Your brother loves you, she told me. You're his only girl, she told me. And then she asked, would you like me to pretend to be your brother? I begged her to pretend, and I lost myself pretending. I drowned in happiness pretending. 
and my happiness drowned everyone I loved, Jan first of all. Now you're contradicting yourself. I thought that letter Sophia sent was responsible for all that happened. If your logic could bring Jan back, I'd have more faith in it, she exclaims angrily. Mimicking Yasna, she goes on, didn't Sabina communicate something about the passion to live? And where was Sabina when we drowned in that passion? Why did we all have to suffer the consequences? Your brother loves you. I knew it was true. So did you. Everyone knew. We didn't hide our love. The devil. I thought she was going to help us the way she did that morning. That morning, Sabina made herself the object of a superstitious old woman's wrath, provoking Myrna's mother with taunts and insults, while Myrna's father kept the broom from leaving the ground. Jan and Myrna were a few houses away. I walked toward them in a bewildered stupor. Myrna, her arms around Jan's neck, cried desperately, Take me with you, Jan. Take me to the city. Please don't make me stay here. Jan told her, It's not possible yet, Myrna. She wailed and pleaded. But it may soon be possible, he told her. Wait a few more days, at most a week. Wait in the clearing. Years later, Myrna took me to that clearing in the forest. I'll be there every day, all day long. I'll sleep there, she said. Jan told her, smiling, Don't do that, silly. You'll get sick. Be there in a week, a week from yesterday. If the rest of us do better than this spineless friend of mine, a lot is going to be possible. Everything is going to be possible. With an expression whose pathos I still remember, the ten-year-old girl pleaded, Promise, Jan, promise. He said sadly, I promise. I'll take you away from here. We'll leave the clearing and walk through the forest to the neighboring village, and we'll think we're dreaming, because the village won't be there anymore. We'll find thousands of people building a city like no city that's ever been built, and they'll welcome us and ask us to help, because they'll all be our friends. There won't be any policemen or prying old women, because they'll all be too busy building or making love. We'll stay in our friend's beautiful city as long as we want, and not a minute longer. We'll be as free as birds. We'll roam across the entire country. We'll visit streams and caverns and other cities. And in each city, we'll find only friends. They'll all beg us to join them in what they're doing, and we won't know which way to turn, because every activity which we're invited to will seem more gratifying than all the rest. I heard Myrna's pathetic plea. I heard Jan's fairy tale. But I registered nothing. I was angry about the fact that Jan and Sabina had tricked me. I wanted to get back to the real world, the world of Louisa, the world of meetings and posters and demonstrations. I remember that it was a Monday morning. The following Monday, the strike ended. Two days later, we were arrested. I nudged Jan and said, Let's go back. We'll be late for the meeting, and it'll be an important meeting. We're to decide which steps to take now. Jan freed himself from Myrna's embrace, turned to me, and said bitterly, Damn your meetings, Yarostan. That's not where any steps are going to be taken. Then he kissed Myrna's forehead and said to me, But you're right. That's all we've got to go back to. He rushed to Sabina, lifted her away in, from in front of his mother, and carried her off while she continued shouting. As we walked away, Jan shouted, Goodbye, Father. Myrna ran after us and shouted, Don't forget, Jan, you promised. We were late for the meeting, but Jan was right. No steps were taken. We spent the week doing all those exciting things you still remember, and then we were arrested. Jan did keep part of his promise, though, Myrna tells me the only part he was able to keep. You mean you saw him again before our arrest? I went to the clearing every day, hoping he'd be there. He came exactly when he said, in a week. But he wasn't the same. Something inside him was broken. He didn't kiss me. He didn't even touch me. When he talked, he didn't look at me. The devil had made me beg to do him something he couldn't do, and he had broken himself trying. I love you the way a brother loves his sister, Myrna. No less and no more. Do you understand that, he asked me. I didn't understand that. The devil was in my veins. I was angry. I reached for more. Sabina showed me how much you loved me, I told him. He turned his back to me. Forget what Sabina showed you, he said, and I knew he was sad when he said it, because I wanted him to be sad when he said that. Forget you ever heard of Sabina. What she showed you is impossible, and not even Sabina knows how to make it possible. Only a revolution will make it possible, and there aren't enough Sabinas for that revolution. Not today. Not here. I tried. Believe me when I tell you I tried. But there weren't enough of us trying, and we failed. Failed. Please understand what that means, Myrna. Everything we dreamed is going to be impossible, and there's nothing to do but forget it until the next time. If you can't forget, at least pretend to forget. Lock your feelings in your heart and keep them locked there every minute of every day. If you let them out, that old vampire and all the vampires of this world are going to tear your heart to shreds. Do you understand that? I didn't understand anything. He sounded sincere, but I didn't believe a word he said. I got on my knees and prayed to him. I begged him to take me to the city. Nothing would be possible if he, le if he left me in that house with those peasants, that horrid mother. In the city, I'd be just like you and Jan and Sabina. In the city, everything would be possible. Sabina would be there. She'd know. She'd show me. Why did I have to pretend not to be what I was, not to feel what I felt, not to love those I loved? Who would tear my heart to shreds? I didn't believe Jan. I didn't believe him until the vampires tore my hearts to shreds. 
Jan left me in the clearing, alone, angry. I returned the following week, and the week after that, but he didn't come for me. One day my father told me Jan and all his friends were locked up, far away. Then I believed what he told me. I learned to pretend. I pretended for four years, and when he returned, I went on pretending. I was engaged to a peasant I knew in school. I pretended I'd never loved Jan, and he didn't even remember he told me to pretend. He was upset about that peasant, for my own sake, for the sake of my future, not for his own sake. When you came, I pretended you were Jan, and I've pretended ever since. How does that make you feel? What difference does it make, Myrna? What if I pretended you were Louisa? I still loved Louisa when I first made love to you. Does that make any difference to you? Would it have then? Is that what you did to Sophia? Did you pretend she was Louisa when you made love to her? No, Myrna. If I pretended you were Louisa, it was because I loved you the way I had loved Louisa. I didn't pretend Sophia was anyone I had ever loved. I only used her. That's why I could never tell her. Couldn't she tell? That's what I'd like to know. Couldn't you tell? I had seen you at Louisa's. I should now say your house, the house in which Louisa and I had made love countless times. How could you not tell? I saw you again at that meeting after Jan and I returned from his family's house. I saw you exactly as Yasna still remembers you, as the prim, well-mannered, perfectly correct young lady, amazingly well-informed and incredibly naive. I read your description of your passion for Jose with disbelief. I can't imagine how Hugh could have characterized you as he did. It was I who was wrong. I know that now my picture of you was as false as your picture of me. It was nevertheless that picture I saw. It was that person I seduced. I don't want to insult you, Sophia. You are very pretty, even beautiful, in your own delicate way. I'm sure you still are. But for me, your beauty wasn't the beauty of flesh and limbs. It wasn't a beauty that stimulated passion. It was the beauty of a porcelain statue, cold, fragile, hollow. You were no Louisa, not then, not to me. With what passion Louisa had expressed herself at that meeting? It was that passion that hurled me into frenzied activity. Yet you remember only the words. When she shouted, the workers have to run the factories by themselves. We have to make all our lives our own and run all of it. I didn't hear only words. I saw the desire in her eyes and on her lips. I felt the passion in all her movements. That's why I agreed with Louisa while simultaneously agreeing with Jan. Their words seemed to contradict each other, but I thought their passions were identical. Louisa talked of running the factories, Jan of burning them, but both communicated the same thought to me. The thought of a life we've dared only to dream, and only those of us who've dared to dream. What I felt and heard had to do with willful, passionate human beings whose biographies were to consist of realized desires and not of paid instructions, whose factory aisles, if they must have factories, were to be carpeted with the mattresses Sabina described to you. That's why I worked with passion to put Louisa's slogans on posters and on walls inside other factories. Those slogans were all I retained of Louisa's love. After the meeting, she kissed Mark Glavney on his lips and walked away with her arm around him. It was only then I turned to you, Sophia. That was when I asked if you wanted to help me print posters. That was when I gave you a tour of the plant and rode with you the following day distributing posters. It wasn't love or passion or desire that drove me to you, Sophia, but only frustration and resentment. You tell me that my caresses didn't equal Jose's, yet you love me. Couldn't you draw your conclusions? The only desire I felt towards you was the desire to take a porcelain statue in my arms and shatter it to splinters. Yet you responded to every request I made with the same polite, Yes, Yarostan, it would please me very much. When we returned to the plant after distributing our posters, I asked if you'd like to spend the night with me in the plant. Yes, Yarostan, it would please me very much. I slept. I dreamt of Louisa. You didn't rouse a shadow of desire in me. You shyly placed your arm next to mine, but ever so politely. I couldn't make myself pretend you were Louisa. I did desire you once, Sophia, for an instant. You, pl you politely consented to spend the following night with me. That night's love is undoubtedly the love you've remembered for twenty years. That's the night I've tried to make myself forget. But if I'm going to expose the falseness of your feelings towards me, I can't continue hiding the foul root from which they sprang. I intentionally placed our blanket near the street entrance to the workshop. You responded politely to my caresses. I was sure you said everything you thought you should say, and you turned exactly as you thought you should turn. It was only the following morning that my desire for you grew. You were nervous. You knew how late it was. But you remained in my arms, smiling your polite, fragile, nervous smile. Suddenly the workshop entrance was wide open. Sunlight streamed in. Louisa shouted, Oh, excuse us, as she and Mark scurried past us into the shop. Titus arrived a second later. My satisfaction was complete when, red with shame, you ran to the stockroom with a blanket draped around you. I had broken the porcelain statue. I did it out of resentment toward Louisa and toward Titus, out of frustration, out of spite. How you hated Alec when you saw him embracing Louisa for what you took to be similar motives. 
I loved you, desired you, Sophia, during one instant. The instant when you turned red with shame. The instant when Louisa, Titus, and Mark looked at the correct young lady having intercourse on the workshop floor right by the street entrance in broad daylight. The devil put that into your head, Myrna exclaims. I don't want to hide behind the devil, Myrna. What I did to Sophia was monstrous, and I feel I should tell her that her love for me is built on rot. You'll be boasting. Do you think any such idea could have come into your head on its own? Don't you recognize its author? Only three days earlier, Jan had asked you to do exactly the same thing in my house, to my mother. Did you think that was Jan's idea? The two pranks are identical, Yarostan, and neither you nor Jan were such ingenious pranksters. It has the devil's signature on it. Don't you see it even now? The prank was designed to drive my mother out of her wits. By making Sophia the queen of the peasants, you merely made the prank useless to Jan and postponed the completion of the devil's plan until a time when Jan could no longer derive any satisfaction from it. That's terribly garbled, Myrna. I insulted Sophia. She revenged herself twice over. She told you she left jail in two days, abandoning you and Jan to four years in prison. Then she went on to take everything you hadn't given her, and she thanked you for all of it, from spite. That prank would have served Jan's aims far better than it served yours. Did you ever regain Louisa's love? Was she waiting for you at the prison gate when you were released four years later? Yet you still loved Louisa then. It's you I feel sorry for, not Sophia. The three of them took twelve years of, from your life and the heart out of mine, yet you're groveling, apologizing. I'm sorry, Sophia, for having played your sister's prank on you. I should have played it on Myrna's mother. That's all constructed with your mother's superstitious logic, Myrna, and it doesn't refer to what actually happened. No, I didn't regain Louisa's love. Yes, I did love her, long after that. But that has nothing to do with the fact that the police arrested us and... Why were you and Jan arrested? Tell me that. Tell me why the three of them were released two days later. Did they try to release their comrades when they were out? Tell me that. I can't tell Myrna that. I don't know why. Myrna's superstitious analysis is garbled, but her questions are perfectly clear, and they raise more problems than I'm willing to face. The day after I pulled my, quote, prank on you, or Sabina's prank, if Myrna is right, the rumor spread among us that Louisa's companion, George Alberts, had been expelled from his plant. The following day, Claude and Adrian told me Alberts was a spy who had worked for the enemy during the war, and that Louisa was in some way his accomplice. I knew these were lies, manufactured by Claude's police mentality, and I also knew that Claude had waited long for his revenge against Louisa. I dismissed Claude and Adrian as repressive maniacs. Claude later worked with the police, and it's obviously because of him that the police added espionage and collaboration with the Alberts spy ring to their list of charges against us. In prison, I was shown a foreign newspaper clipping, according to which George Alberts and his family were settling abroad in the comfort provided for them by the government they had served. These typical police maneuvers didn't shatter my trust in or admiration for Louisa. Nothing was odd to me until you told me two or three months ago that Louisa's prison term had only lasted for two days. The slanderous rumors spread by Claude, the elaborate scheme invented by the police, the fact that Louisa was gone when I was released, none of that bothered me. But the knowledge that she'd been released after two days in jail would have bothered me. I knew the police regularly bungled their own elaborately concocted schemes by giving shorter terms to those they designated ringleaders than to those they designated mere accomplices. But I couldn't have made myself believe that they had bungled so far as to release the entire, quote, center of the ring after only two days while leaving the accomplices locked up for four years. I didn't even believe the clipping I'd been shown in prison. The day I was released, I went directly to Louisa's house. Complete strangers lived there. They'd lived there for four years and hadn't ever heard of a Nachalo or an Alberts family. I concluded she was either in jail still or that the clipping was authentic. When I brought this up to Jan a week or two later, he told me he'd seen the same clipping, hadn't ever doubted its authenticity, and hadn't been bothered by it. Did you expect them to stay here? he asked. Obviously not. I no longer doubted the authenticity of the clipping, and I wasn't bothered by it. There was nothing odd to me about the fact that Louisa had settled abroad after being released from prison into an environment that offered no release from prison. Once I accepted her absence, I even felt stimulated by it. She had left me behind to continue her work. I wondered how proud of me she'd have been if she'd heard me repeat every one of her stories and every one of her theories to Myrna and her father. So you didn't pretend I was Louisa, Myrna exclaims. I didn't say I did. I only asked what difference it would have made. No, obviously I didn't pretend you were Louisa. You had nothing at all in common with her. But you had everything in common with her. You became Louisa, and I became you. There's a great deal of truth in that. Myrna became my political pupil, just as I had once been Louisa's. Even the content of the lessons was, was the same. The workers had done it once, and they could do it again. They had defeated a whole army, taken hold of the land and the factories, and started to forge their own world. And we were going to forge it again, arm in arm. 
But I didn't communicate my project to Myrna as successfully as Louisa had communicated hers to me. What Myrna heard was ter totally unrelated to what I said. I gradually realized she wanted life while I was offering her politics. I became Louisa, but only in my own eyes. You became someone else in my eyes, Yerostan, someone I wanted very badly. Every word you spoke expressed what I longed to hear. You were my brother, as I had known him before his prison term. You fulfilled his promise to me. You satisfied the desire Sabina had roused in me. And in the end, you were the instrument that destroyed my family because Sabina devised a prank. You've been obsessed with that superstition ever since Sophia's letter arrived, Myrna. Sabina had nothing to do with my coming to your house after my release. She'd been gone during all four years of my imprisonment. I came because Jan was my best friend. I knew where his parents lived, and I hoped they'd know his whereabouts. You weren't her conscious instrument. I was, she continued stubbornly. You didn't know what your coming to us meant. I knew. Jan had warned me. My mother didn't let a day pass without telling me. She told me the same thing over and over again, like a record that's played day after day until you finally stop hearing it. How she had single-handedly tried to bring us up in the way of the Lord, but the Lord had sent a scourge on all of us because my father had transgressed the Lord's way and trafficked with the devil. To you, she was always just a crazy old woman with crazy explanations, but she wasn't as crazy as you thought. My father had run out after our neighbor's wife in the village. Maybe he'd even slept with her. Jan and I joked about it when we were little, and Father winked at me, knowing perfectly well that I knew. Everyone knew, including the neighbor. When the war came, that neighbor went to the occupation authorities, told them some tales about my father, and in a single day we lost our yard, our chickens, our house, everything. An enormous army didn't occupy this country for five years in order to punish your father's sexual affairs, Myrna. Myrna kicks me and shouts, You keep your explanations and I'll keep mine. What good do your explanations do anyway? My mother explained what happened to us and why. Yours don't explain anything at all. They've got nothing to do with me. As soon as we left the Lord's path, we started our journey to perdition, and Jan's imprisonment was only a stop along the way. That was what she told me 20 years ago, and nothing you ever said was more true. If we'd stayed in the village, Jan would be alive today. My father would be 63 and still as vigorous as a bull. My mother would only be 58, and she'd be no crazier than any of our neighbors. I hated her Lord as much as I hated her Lord's path, but only after we'd moved to the outskirts of the city. Which, which she called a den of sin. If I'd grown up in the village, I'd have been just like her. After we moved, I loved my father, and I loved what he'd done, even though I knew everything she said was true. I believed her, but I didn't want to be like her. I came to hate her more than Jan ever did, but I still believed her. You're going to be the devil's bride, she told me. The devil possessed your father first, then he visited your brother. He came to you last, but you're going to be the one who drives the devil's sword into our flesh. She pointed her finger at me with such hatred. She actually saw the devil in me. I screamed, liar, superstitious hag, and after Sabina taught me, vampire. But I knew it was true, and I wanted it to be true. My arms, my lips, my whole body ached for the devil. I longed to be the devil's bride, and I dreamed of driving the devil's sword into her flesh. The devil's bride, Jan's bride, my father's bride. Everything she said I'd be, I wanted to be. But I didn't have the nerve. I only had the nerve to do it, as Sabina had taught me, by pretending. And pretending was good enough. The devil doesn't know the difference. I no longer know the difference either. I've already driven that blood-stained sword into all but three of us, and I'm still holding it. Myrna, don't interrupt, Yarostan. You don't understand anything. I had my second encounter with the devil, at long last, a year before you or Jan were released. He came in the shape of a boy I knew in seventh grade. We were both thirteen. It was with him that I tried to complete what I'd never carried out with Jan, what I'd completed only once, the night Sabina pretended to be Jan. I don't remember his name because I called him Jan. Everyone else in class thought me strange. They, kn they knew I had the devil in me, and they were afraid. But the peasant boy I called Jan liked me very much because I was strange. He spoke to me, touched me, walked me home. One day I didn't walk home after school. I pulled him into the clearing in the forest where Jan and I had played when we were little. We were all alone. I removed all of my clothes and started to tear his off. He was frightened. I begged him to pretend to be the devil, my brother, but he didn't know how to pretend. I was so hungry, so terribly hungry. I pushed his naked body to the ground and shouted, Take me, Jan, take me. I'm your bride, the devil's bride. When I, when I was on him, he sobbed and shook with fear. He jumped away from me and ran off with his clothes, leaving me alone in the clearing. If you were a monster to Sophia, what was I to that peasant? A few days later, I learned the devil doesn't care if the deed is pretended or real, nor even if it's carried through to its consummation. All he cares about is the desire, the devil's passion. The boy's father was killed. The fathers of several other students in my class were arrested. 
They had all worked in a neighboring town where there had been a confrontation with the police. The day I had taken the boy to the clearing, a strike had broken out. It wasn't just a strike. It was Jan's strike. What those workers wanted was the revolution, the world where everything would be possible, and they were all arrested, every last one of them. Some were killed. My peasant's father had only worked there for a month. I heard about that rising during my first term. The fact that it broke out when you were having your affair was a coincidence, Myrna, a trivial coincidence. Those workers had tried. My whole life's meaning is built out of such coincidences, Myrna snaps, then proceeds to silence me definitively. Marbles experience coincidences, Yarastan. People experience meanings. Do you know the difference? I knew what I had done, and so did the boy. He was terrified. Death itself couldn't have frightened him more than what I did. He avoided me as if I carried the plague. Not because of what I'd done to him in the clearing, but because of what we had both done to his father. If he were here now, I'd make you ask him. His fear made me afraid, afraid of myself, afraid of that deviled sword my mother had already seen in my hand. For the rest of that year, I tried hard to be like everyone else. But I had communicated to the peasant. Don't you see she was right? Once you step ever so briefly into the devil's path, you'll never ever leave it, no matter how hard you try. He had stepped into it, only for an instant, but by the end of the year, the same passion started to burn in him. He spoke to me again. He walked me home. He had learned to pretend. He pretended we weren't responsible for what happened to his father. One day he pushed me against a wall in a dark corner and asked me to marry him. He wanted the devil, but all to himself, not in broad daylight in the clearing, where I could pretend he was Jan but at night in his own private bedroom where I wouldn't be able to pretend to be anything other than what I'd become, the peasant's wife. I consented. He spoke to my parents and arrangements were made. We were to be married at the end of the school year. His older sister was going to be married at the same time, which meant he'd take charge of what they called their farm. They raised a few chickens, some vegetables, and supplied our street with milk from their three cows. Those cows are as close as I ever got to the sheep you think I herded. On one of my visits, his sister showed me how to milk them, to prepare me for the chores I'd be doing until I died. A month later, Jan returned, completely changed. He didn't look the same or act the same. He wasn't only older, he was broken. And I had broken him. I pretended that I loved my peasant, that I'd never loved Jan, that I'd never learned anything from Sabina, that the devil didn't flow in my veins, that I liked to milk cows. We didn't speak to each other in the house. We never went out together, and we slept in separate rooms with both our doors closed. That old hawk found nothing at all to reproach in our behavior, although her eyes followed us every minute around the clock. But the truth is that the devil's passion still burned inside me, and it broke through with all its force one night when I was out on a walk alone. I accidentally ran into Jan. He asked me, Are you really going to go through with that marriage? I told him, Yes, I am, and I can't wait. He asked, Couldn't you find someone with more life in him, someone slightly less shallow? I felt my passion rising, but I crushed it and told him, I love him exactly as he is, Jan and I love his cows and his chickens, and he didn't let me go on. You hate cows and chickens, Myrna. Do you really want to do this for the rest of your life? That instant, everything broke through. I burned. I threw my arms around his neck and begged, Why are you asking me? You know perfectly well what I want. He forced my arms off his neck and said, But that's impossible, Myrna. He walked away from me, but I knew he was crying. The following day, I pretended to forget. I pretended to look forward to my life, milking cows and throwing corn to chickens. But two weeks before the marriage, you came to our house. The moment I saw you, I knew the devil had sent you to me, and I went wild. I gave my heart to the devil out of sheer gratitude. I became the devil's bride. I gave myself up wholly and unreservedly to my passion. Deny it all you want. I knew exactly why you had come and who had sent you. Don't you remember the first thing the devil made you ask? Are you Jan's wife? My lips told you, no, silly, but my heart said, yes, yes, Sabina Jan, father devil. I'm your wife. Take me, right here, right now. Oh, Yarostan, I'm melting just thinking about it. I loved you the instant I set my eyes on you. I almost wrapped myself around you right then. I couldn't sleep that night. I was on fire. I longed to crawl into your arms, to drown in you. But I had to fan the fire to its highest heat. I had to set the devil's stage. My heart pounded in my throat the whole next day. I was possessed. I took you out of the house in the morning and paraded you to the whole neighborhood, pressing your body to mine. I had you walk back and forth in front of the peasant's house, and when I finally saw him, I threw my arms around you and kissed you. And how happy I was when you responded with such passion. That ended my marriage to the cows and the chickens. I never saw my peasant again. I learned later he left the neighborhood and went to work in a factory where his father had been killed. I couldn't sleep the second night either. I was doubled up with desire. I wanted to scream. I was starved. I was charred. The following morning, the stage was set. It was a beautiful spring day, the most beautiful in my life. 
crystal clear and warm. It was a blaze of fire that led you to the clearing in the forest. The devil never had a happier bride on a more beautiful ceremony. As I embraced you, I wanted to crawl through your mouth, to embed my skin in your... To... We lay down on the grass. Wait, you told me. Pretend to be Myrna. And I said, I'll pretend to be anyone in the world. I can't exist without you. I pretended to be Jan. Oh, yes, as you did then. I'm on fire. I love you, Myrna. You're my only girl. Oh. You see, Myrna? Pretending didn't matter. We loved each other, no matter who we pretended to be. You pretended to be Louisa, seducing Yarostan. That's marvelous. That's ridiculous. I pretended to be whatever you wanted me to be. In actual fact, I didn't pretend to be anyone. I lost myself in you. Don't you forget it was you who seduced me? Then you were Myrna. All right, I was Myrna. It did matter, Yarostan. Jan penetrated Myrna. I lost my mind. You created a storm I'd never dreamt of. You filled me with Vesna. Vesna was the daughter of a brother and a sister. My mother knew it. Vesna knew it. She always knew it. And she hated both of us because of it. But it was I who let the devil push me to it, and who drove the devil's sword through her heart. Myrna, please don't spoil every happy moment. That's the devil's price. I was so happy when you finally took me away from that house, the Lord's house, my mother's house, when you took me into the den of the sin, the city, where people like you and Jan and Sabina lived. Yes, I wanted curtains and a baby carriage and clothes that made me like everyone else in the city, that made me look and feel different from my mother. And I wanted more, much more. I wanted to find that world Jan had promised, the real den of sin, the devil city, where everything I desired would be possible. But I hadn't paid the devil's price for Vesna, and I started to pay when she was barely out of my stomach. You and Jan were fired, and then the police warned you. They were going to destroy you, both of you. But the real blow came when our neighbors, those workers I had so long wanted to join, turned against us and evicted us. I knew then I was going to have to pay a heavy price for my happiness. I knew the devil was going to strip me of everything, whether he had given it or not. I had been frightened once before when the peasant's father died, but when we returned to my parents' house, I grew terribly frightened. You bear Satan's mark, she told me. You're damned for all eternity. Everything, everything you touch will wither. Everyone you love will die. How I hated her. I'm Satan's bride and I'm proud of it, I shouted at her. I'll drive the devil's sword through you first of all. But I was terrified. Those things you call coincidences. There had already been too many. I couldn't bear to be near my mother, but I didn't want any more coincidences. I found my job. I bought our house. I thought I had cheated the devil, escaped him. I was on my own, no longer dependent on either the Lord or the devil. And for a year, I thought I'd succeeded. I hardly saw you or Jan. I saw Vesna only from the time I picked her up at the nursery until you returned from work. And I never had time to visit my father, but I was happy. I thought the devil was going to let me keep all I had. I thought the devil had forgotten me. Then the stirring began in Magarna, and my heart began to beat faster again. At first, I became even more afraid. I remember the uproar in the town where my peasant father had worked. I remember everyone in the town had been arrested or killed. I trembled when you first described what you'd learned about the events in Magarna. They were the same as those in that town. It was Jan's revolution, yours, and yes, mine. I trembled because I knew how happy they were and how they longed for what could be. I trembled because I knew they'd all be killed. And then the devil again numbed all my senses but one. It happened to my factory. Women who had hardly ever talked to each other started poking each other, running their hands through each other's hair, embracing, even kissing. I longed for that revolution. I wanted it for all of us. I couldn't restrain myself. I was possessed again. I embraced all the women in the factory. I loved every one of them. Do you remember that last Sunday when Jan and Titus came to our house early in the morning? I didn't know which of you I desired most. Titus, the fatherly stranger, Jan, the brother I had loved since childhood, or you, the combination of both, you who had been Myrna and could therefore be Sabina, as well as Satan himself. I desired you the most. You were the most enthusiastic of the three. You wanted that revolution as badly as I did. You're being unjust to Jan. I was blind in my enthusiasm. He saw that what we were doing was self-defeating, just as he'd seen that eight years earlier, and he was right both times. Titus and I were struck on the question of free press. We kept insisting that an ignorant working class cannot possibly chart its own course and build its own world. But Jan was telling us, and no one heard him, that the press was part of that ignorance. He kept pointing out that McGarner workers were already creating forms of human communication which freed the people, not the press. Jan knew that they were all going to be killed or jailed. He knew that everything was going to remain impossible. Jan wasn't only his father's son. I knew too, but the devil was in me, and I didn't care. Titus said the press had brought the spirit of Magarna to workers who had lost their abilities to act, and I loved the press for that, as I loved Titus for saying it. The press was the devil's instrument. It did the devil's work. It put life into shriveled carcasses. It transformed the frightened women. 
in my factory into reckless maniacs. It filled you with life. It filled me with unquenchable desire. I'll never forget, Myrna. You took me to that clearing again. I dreamed of that for the next eight years. That time I didn't pretend to be anyone other than Myrna because I wanted you, all of you, every one of you, everyone I had ever thought you to be, my brother, my father, Titus, yourself, Sabina, and all the workers in Magarna. I gave myself to all of you without shame, without pretending. And I suppose you think that's why Yara... I don't suppose, I know. Yara would pick up the devil's sword the moment I dropped it. But I'll never drop it. I can't. It's part of me. Part of my flesh. It's in my heart. The devil sent me two bills of charges, only three, three days later. They weren't just bills for those days of happiness, but for all of the previous years. The devil wanted all of his back pay. I thought I cheated him out of that, but he had merely extended credit to his favorite bride. And now the sum was enormous. The first bill of charges was in the newspaper that Wednesday morning. Tanks were killing Magarna workers, inside buildings, in schools, on the streets. How I wanted to die with them, to kill that passion that had possessed me. How I wished the devil had also the power to bring those workers back to life. The women in my factory might as well have died that morning. All their love was gone. They were lifeless, as still as the dead. Hell is the silence of the graveyard. A week later, those who had come to life first vanished. We've been still ever since, until last week, and we're still again. We remember the tanks. How can Yasna speak of the courage in those who never faced the tanks? The devil sent his second bill by special messenger. It came in the form of a letter from Sophia Nashalo, but I knew who the letter was from as soon as he told me he'd left an identical letter for Jan at my father's house. I knew you wouldn't come back and Jan wouldn't come again. I knew even before the police came for the letter two hours later. I knew I had to pay for Vesna, for my passion, for my happiness. Don't, don't tell me the letter arrived the same day the tanks entered Magarna by coincidence. Don't tell me it was a coincidence that the messenger arrived at my house the very minute when you and Jan were being arrested a hundred kilometers away, not an hour sooner or an hour later. Don't interrupt, Yarostan. I took the trouble to find that out. Two, two years after your arrest, I got a day off to visit you in prison. They w wouldn't let me in. They said I had the wrong permit. The permit had changed. I took the train to a, the steel town and waited for the workers to come out. I ran to the first group and told them who I was. They all knew both of you. I told them I had found you and asked if they knew where Jan was. They were silent, with that silence of death. Their faces answered. They didn't know, but they all knew. Then I asked about the day when you and Jan were arrested. They told me lots of workers had been arrested. When, I asked. A week later. You and Jan were the only ones arrested on that Wednesday, just as you left the plant at the end of the workday. You were arrested the very minute the messenger reached my door. Don't tell me about coincidences. They don't explain anything. I knew the moment the letter came, but I didn't want him to believe it. I took Vesna to the train station and waited for the later train. We sat and waited for the train after that. Then there were no later trains. I carried Vesna to the tram stop, and we rode to the transfer point, but the next tram was no longer running. I carried Vesna for hours, drenched with sweat and, un un and unable to breathe. I didn't want to stop to rest. I knocked weakly and heard my mother shout, Bar the door! Don't let the devil in! My father opened it, and I fell into his arms, bawling. Damned witch, Satan's whore, you brought destruction on our house, she screamed, endlessly crossing herself. My father forced her out of the room, and she spent the night praying to the wooden Jesus in her room, shouting, wailing, and beating the floor, continually repeating, perdition, and Satan's whore. She had started to scream the moment the letter had arrived. She'd known what it had meant as well. When the police came, she immediately gave them the letter, but my father snatched it out of their hands. They had no right to take a letter addressed to his son. The two, the two police immediately started to beat him. He had no rights, they told him. He was the father of a criminal, and therefore an enemy of the people. They even threatened to arrest him for interfering with the people's police and for protecting a criminal. But he wasn't broken. He smiled and tried to comfort me. He said you and Jan were both strong. You had both been through all that before, and you'd know how to take care of yourselves. I begged him to find a pretext to drive his bus to the repair depot next to the union building, and to find out if Titus had been arrested too. If only we could find Titus, he'd surely know where you and Jan were. I hardly slept. My mother's prayers mingled with my own fears. I took the first morning tram. I couldn't afford to be a minute late for work. I knew they'd fire me. That would have completed the devil's plan right then. I would have lost the house. I couldn't have fed Vesna. But the devil has time. He has all eternity. And he had me wait, taking his toll slowly, one victim at a time. I returned for Vesna that evening, exhausted from lack of sleep, sick from worrying, but anxious to learn if my father had found Titus. I walked in without knocking, and I knew right away that the, f that the fiend had already struck again. My mother stood in the middle of the room, clutching a broom with one hand, waving her other hand in my face, and singing a hocus-pocus, 
with which she drove devils away. Vesna stood in a corner trembling with fright and bawling, her back turned to me. My father sat in his chair and stared as if he were blind. They had broken him. I shook him hysterically and asked what happened. I was never late, never sick. For twelve years I drove that bus, every day of the week, on Sundays if they needed me. I burst out crying and begged him to tell me what happened. Father of a criminal, accomplice of a traitor, saboteur. They'd fired him. He didn't say anything more, he just stared. My mother lifted the broom with one hand, clutched Vesna with the other and screamed, Out of this house, witch! Get out and take all the devils with you! I ran for Vesna, but she clutched the child and kept me away with her broom. I'll go, only give me Vesna, I begged. But she hit me with that broom and screamed, You'll not give this innocent child to the devil. You've given your master enough. The child is still innocent. I'll keep her innocent. Shameless horror. You're not to take this child to perdition. Live alone. Repent. It's too late to pray for your own salvation. Pray for the child's. Beg the Lord to remove your curse from this child. Be her suppliant. You'll never be her mother. I was on my knees, bent over, crying. She didn't hit me again. My father suddenly got out of his chair. I looked up. The stupor in his eyes was gone. He forced her hands and her arms away from Vesna. For a moment, Vesna stood in front of me, trembling, terrified. Then she turned and ran back to the woman, clutched her black skirt, and buried her face in it. My father picked her up as I rushed to the door. He handed Vesna to me. Tears streamed down his withered, wrinkled cheeks. I ran to the tram stop, hurting from Vesna's kicks, deafened by her screams. She was only two and a half, but she already had a will of her own. I carried her off against her will. I knew what the consequence would be, but I had to have Vesna. She was mine. She was all that was left to me of my love, my desire, my passion. Do you know what time it is? Why didn't you tell me sooner, she exclaims angrily. I'll be late for work. It was Thursday morning. That night I had started this letter. I hadn't known Myrna's father had been fired from his bus driving job. When Titus visited me in prison, I learned he was ill, and when Myrna visited me later, three years after my ar arrest, I learned he had died. It's Saturday night now. I'm tired, and I don't have anything more to tell you. Yara is to return from her outing late next week. I haven't seen Yasna since she left our house crying Wednesday evening. When I started this letter, I wanted to get to the root of your feelings toward me. I wanted to make it clear to you that I would not have been comfortable in that community of journalists which you imagined me, that I felt more kinship with Ted and Tissy, and that the world which seemed so exotic to you. But I'm falling asleep. Yara Stem. <laughs>